Anybody uh, <coughs> would like a copy of God's Word? Uh, New Testament in its entirety is uh, offered freely to you here this afternoon. God's Word, which is, uh, as it uh, self says, um, able to make you wise unto salvation, a salvation that is, is to be found in our Lord Jesus Christ, who we come to declare amongst you once again here this afternoon. You'd like a copy of God's Word really offered, no obligation to you, and yours only and simply for the taking. Come and ask us for one if you would like one. It is, uh, when all said and done, the Word of God, and of course, uh, the highest authority that there is, uh, there is no higher, uh, higher than uh, the uh, dictates of science, the philosophies of men, and of course, uh, even that of governments, human government. <coughs> is by uh, uh, the power the authority of God. And of course, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, following his resurrection from the dead, uh, declares to us that all authority, all power that is in heaven and on earth too, is given unto him. He rules and reigns both in heaven and on earth. He is the ultimate ruler. And the one, of course, before whom we must all bow the knee one day, as uh, the Word of God itself says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And of course, it's our hope and our prayer uh, for you that uh, you would come to uh, that place of uh, surrender, yielding, that is, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, rather than, uh, rather than later as your judge. And of course, that is being on the wrong side of the judge. That in salvation, that you might find in his name that which we all need, a Savior, and salvation from a very real and known danger that of our sin, because we are all of us, we are born in sin, the Bible says, we are conceived in sin, we live in sin, and we will die in sin, unless that is we bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we bid you this afternoon to raise the white flag, to surrender, to bow to King Jesus, in order that you might be saved. Reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 18 this afternoon. For you, no man hath seen God at any time. No man can see God and live. He has to be, you see, he has to be mediated to us. He is that uh, so holy, you know, and so other, you might say, he's incompatible God. And we are sinners, you know, so um, for you, a sinful human being, I, you know, to, to see God, um, that would directly, I mean, that would be to our uh, destruction to the utmost. We need, you see, someone to stand between us and God, someone to mediate on our behalf. And of course, that's someone, that person, is Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That's what, that's what the Father sent the Son for. You see the Bible. It makes it clear and plain. And, well, another reason why we, uh, when we come to you, we offer you uh, copies of God's Word, God's uh, Holy Book, because... Um, that's the only place you see where God uh, reveals himself, you know, in his character and being. 
And you can have uh, all kinds of fanciful ideas about God, and people do, you know? Some people, you know, it's a flight of imagination. And some people, of course, it's because of some uh, religious organization, you know, set up by somebody who had, you know, all claims, you know, to have had a dream, you know, or something, or a vision, you know, in the back rooms of Af Afghanistan, or, you know, um, some cult or sect, you know, in North America, you know, all kinds of claims, you know, that that people have, you know, about the being a curse of God. But you look at every one of them, and concerning, you know, God's being, there's none of them matches what God himself said. And he has revealed himself in the Bible, whether you can understand this or not, because I don't think anybody can really, you know, get their head around it completely. I mean, if you could, well, then I think, you know, you'd be God yourself. God has revealed himself, one God, not three gods, one God, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father sent the Son, and the Son came, lived and loved and died, and arose again from the dead, that we might be saved, have a mediator between us and God, bring us to God, declare God to us, and God's Holy Spirit, oh, he's the one by whom, you see, you must be reborn, says Jesus, born of the Spirit, because the flesh, you see, profits nothing, in a natural, fleshly condition, you know, we never get beyond, you know, thinking, you know, what shall I eat, what shall I wear, you know, no thought of God in our lives at all, not until we've been reborn. Might be religious, but that's not the same thing. That's the flesh. So you see, Jesus Christ sent by his Father into the world, you know, to, um, well, to declare God, you see, because well, he's the second person of the blessed and holy trinity. There's nobody who knows the Father like the Son. And he's the one, you see, who can, well, declare him, express him, you know, explain him, if you like. Bring us to a knowledge, a real true knowledge of God. And of course, to know God, Jesus says, and to know him whom he sent, that is Jesus himself, well, that is eternal life. A knowing of God, knowing God that is in a covenant relationship. The covenant relationship, you know, of them. That is, you know, a love, you know, loving God, being loved by God and reciprocating that love. That is why Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came. And that's what he accomplished, you see, in his coming, in his living that blameless life. A life that you ought to have lived, but don't and can't. And of course, uh, also, um, you know, not only dying on that cross, uh, paying the price for our sin, because, oh, somebody has to pay the price, you know? If Jesus doesn't pay it, then, well, then you have to pay it and fool yourself. And you can't afford that, you know? So you'll never get out of jail at all. But the gospel, you see, is your... Uh, if you like uh, to put it in human terms, it's uh, you get out of jail free card, you know? Jesus, he paid the price in full. So that those who believe, those who trust in him and his person, as the second person of the blessed and holy trinity, God the Son, uh, those who believe, those who trust in him, would have eternal life in his name. So our question for this afternoon is why is Jesus the Christ that is? He is uh, Jesus, and the name means Savior, because that's what he is and what he does, saves from sins. He shall save his people from their sins, the Bible says. And he is called the Christ, because he's the anointed one, anointed, appointed, ordained of God, you see, to be the Savior of sinners. No other has been so anointed, so ordained, you know, by God, you see. For a person to do such a work as this, to save, you know, a world of sinners, well, you know, oh, God has to authorize it, you know. 
and you stop and think about it for a while, you know, you, you think of these many, many other religions and people. I mean, did Muhammad die for sinners? Is he not still dead in his grave, just like John Brown, molding in his grave? No, no dear friends, he, he didn't. Uh, he didn't die for sinners, and neither did any pope, you know. Only one person who did die, and rose again from the dead, defeated death, and that's Jesus, the Christ, the anointed, appointed one. The one so, so full of the Holy Spirit of God, you know, and empowered to do this fantastic, this great work. And now, of course, because he has accomplished it, now he reigns and rules supremely in heaven and earth, all things under his feet. The Son of God, who loved sinners, who came, lived and loved and died, in order that they might receive reconciled to God. That is, and brought into a loving relationship with God that is endless and can never be broken an inviolable, unbreakable relationship with the living and true God. How magnificent, how wonderful. Now you see, perhaps, understand maybe in a measure, I don't know just how good news, glad tidings, this really is. The question this afternoon is, why is he the Son of God, Jesus the Christ? Why is he called the only begotten Son, since, well, you know, we who are believers, you know, we are called the children of God. So what's the difference? Well, you see, you got to understand first and foremost, you're not a child of God until you've received, until you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people, you know, they go about with the ideas of misunderstanding. You know, they think to themselves that, well, we're all children of God, aren't we? Because God made us all, so we're his offspring, so we must all be children of God. Not so, my friends. The Bible says to as many, not everybody, but to as many as received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gives the, he gave the right, the power, the authority, that is, to be called the children of God. So only a person has believed, truly believed with a true and living faith, believed on Jesus Christ, it is only then they become children of God. So what's the difference? What's the distinction? Why is he called the only begotten son since everybody who believes in him is also called a child of God? Well, you have to understand that Jesus Christ is the He's the, um, <laughs> you might say the special one, not Mr. Moreno, but uh, Jesus Christ is the special one. He is the natural, he is the eternal son of God. You see, um, he is God, he is God himself. Now, some of my Muslim friends, you know, they, they have a difficulty with this. They say, well, you know, where does, where in the Bible does um, Jesus Christ say that he is God? Well, it's all over the place, you know? But you have to use, you know, your reason. You have to read the Word of God with understanding, you know, and, um, well, with God's help himself, you know? But uh, the Bible does say, you see, he was God manifest in the flesh. Again and again, he uses the term concerning himself. He says, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And he's using, he's referring to a phrase used by God himself back in the Old Testament of the Bible, the book of Exodus, where God says, I am who I am. What Jesus is actually saying is that he is God. He's the second person of the Holy Trinity. He's the Son of God and God the Son. And you see, he's the eternal Son of God. Uh, just like, you know, the question people ask sometimes, well, who made God? Well, the answer is nobody made God. He's, he's eternal and everlasting. He always was and always is and always shall be. And so, too, the only begotten Son of God. He's the eternal Son of God. He didn't become the Son of God. 
He always was the Son of God. Always, eternally, always will be, right? All throughout all the ages of eternity, He will be the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. And then, of course, well, He's a natural Son, you know? He's a natural Son of God. I mean, that is, you know, that, that we have to be adopted, you know? God adopts His children. But the Son of God, but Jesus Christ, He is, you know, He is, he is a natural Son, sent by His Father into the world, you know, to do the business of our salvation, to accomplish salvation for us, so that we could become children of God. By adoption, that is. God adopts his children, you see. Now, you know, I'm sure, as well as I do, what happens in society, if you want to adopt a child, I adopted too, don't you know? And of course, we had to go through a legal process, you know? You couldn't just wish it on yourself or the children concerned. You know, there had to be authority. There has to be the authority of the parents to begin with. I mean, if I didn't want those children to be mine, well then, you know, they wouldn't be mine. You know, I had to want, I had to desire them to be mine. And then, of course, go through all the process in which they legally become my children. But here's the thing, dear friends, you see, God, God is the parent, if you like, he's the father, you know, and he chooses, he chooses, not you, not the, not the, the, the children themselves, he chooses who will be his children. So you see, uh, the choice is not down to you and I, the choice is down to God. And of course, if you read some more of the Bible, you'll find that salvation, the very written source of it, you know, is, is God's, um, uh, God's election process that well, took, happen, you know, took place happen before he created the universe. God chose himself a people, you know, a certain number of people. He chose himself a church. He chose those whom he would adopt to be his children. So you see, that's the difference. Jesus Christ, he is the, if you like, the natural son of God, and we are adopted children. And God, you see, was able to adopt us um, because of his grace, through his grace, you see, his loving kindness, his great mercy. And there was no pressure on God, no necessity, no requirement. All sinners, all separated from God, all rebels in flight from God, apostates from God, uh, entered into a, an agreement, a contract with sin through Adam, our first parents, you know, and, and, and ostracized, alienated from God. We all like sheep have gone astray. All of sin that come short of the glory of God, conceived in sin, born in sin, children of wrath, not children of God. Because of that, you see. But God, out of a mere heart of love and grace, sent his only begotten son into the world that through him that we might become children of God. It's a matter of grace, you see. Not a matter of religious activity. Not, not, not a, a matter of, you know, you're, you're being good, doing good, trying to be good, and not being successful. Just a matter of grace, you see. The Bible says before his children, before they had ever done anything good or bad, they were actually children of God. In principle, but in time, you see, God causes those who are His to hear His gospel, to hear His good news, and to believe upon and to receive His Son from heaven, who died, who died that death on their behalf to take their penalty, their punishment, to rise again from the dead so that they might have the victory to over sin and death and hell. And be children of God. And not just for time, but for all eternity. 
everlastingly children of God and uh, the, the admiration of God throughout all eternity, not because of anything that they had done, accomplished, simply and only because of God's grace in them. They'd be objects of God's admiration for all eternity because of Jesus, because of the only begotten Son of God and what he's accomplished on their behalf. But of course, if you do not become a child of God, if you do not repent, if you do not believe the gospel, the good news, if you do not believe in the only begotten Son, the Son of the Father, well then, you know, well the end's a very sad one, I have to tell you. You be not an object of God's admiration, but an object of God's wrath for all eternity. You see, the Bible tells us that's the state of humankind. Already the wrath of God is revealed against all the ungodliness and all the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of unrighteousness. Why God is angry with the wicked every day. Don't you think somebody ought to be angry with the wicked every day? You see, dear friends, uh, that's the state, you know, the entire human race under the wrath of God. And there's only one person can lift that from off of us set us free from it. Let so lift the wrath of God from off us, so deal with it that God will never, never be angry with you again. Huh? And that's the gospel, that's the only begotten Son of God. That's what he came to do and that's what he accomplished. He was set forth, you see. He was set forth to deal with the wrath, the anger of God, to take it away from us and to cover our sin and all our guilt and all our shame and to bring us into the family of God, make us children of God. But not, of course, like Jesus. He's the eternal Son of God. He's the only begotten Son of God. And all this, you see, through the grace of God. So it's grace that you need, you see. Give me grace. That should be your prayer today. Give me grace, God. You know? Because it's grace. Grace is the undeserved favor of God. Grace is what you don't deserve. What you deserve is punishment, penalty. And you can punish people. You can send them to jail. You can put them in prison. But I guarantee that won't make them better. Not much better. That probably make them worse. They come out of prison. And they've learned new tricks, they've learned new crimes, they've learned new ways of doing evil. Punishment, penalty, doesn't improve people. It's not supposed to do. It's simply the penalty for their crimes. And God, you see, God in His grace, you see, in the gospel He presents us with the very opposite. For He says, you see, in grace is I'll take the penalty and I'll give you what you don't deserve. I'll give you what you don't deserve. I have the assurance of heaven. I have the assurance of the forgiveness of all my sins. I have the assurance of being justified before God. Why? Not because of me. Not because of anything that I've done, accomplished. On the contrary. The very opposite, I deserve nothing but the eternal wrath of God. But in grace, through grace, God has given me what I don't deserve. And I tell you, I tell you, you know, that, 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 that in heaven, you know, the children of God, those who are there now, and of course those who will be there, you know, when... When everything is finished, when the world is all wrapped up as we know it now, and the new heaven and the new earth comes in. I tell you, every child of God that ever was, ever shall be, shall be there in heaven. And they'll be asking the question, why am I here? I don't deserve this. I deserve the very opposite. So I tell you too, those who end up in hell, likewise will be saying, this is exactly, this is just what I deserve. You see, the truth, the truth will be known then. 
But I hope, I pray that all you come to know the truth, embrace the truth, believe the truth, in order that, well, that you might become a child of God through grace. Ask God for grace. Yeah? And this, of course, is all, being, all for the sake of Jesus Christ, you know? My colleague and I, we are the children of God, you see, for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we can call, we can call God our Father. Not everybody can. Not everybody can. You don't have the right to that until you're a child of God. But you see, for the sake of Jesus Christ, because the only begotten Son of the Father came, took upon himself flesh, became a man, walked amongst men, a sin-cursed world, abused by the hands of wicked, cruel men, nailed to a cross, dead, buried, raised again from the dead, so that those who believe, those who trust in him, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, become children of God for the sake, for the sake, not for their own sake, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. What a gospel! What good news! What a glorious message for those that is who will believe. So why, our next question is, why do we who are Christians, children of God, why do we call Him Lord? Well, because He purchased us. He purchased us, you see. Not with silver and gold, not with money from Lloyd's Bank or anywhere else. He purchased us. He bought us with his own blood. He bought us back from, from the dark path of sin, all our involvement in sin. By the shedding of his precious blood, he paid the price in full. So that the Christian, you see the child of God, can now say, I am free. I am dead free. I am out from under sin. But you can't say that, you see, until Jesus has purchased you. Until Jesus has paid the price for your sin. You're still in debt. You're a debtor to God. You're a debtor. You, you, you're a sin debtor to God. You see, and God will require the price. The wages of sin, they have to be paid. And they have to be paid out in full. And the wages of sin is death, and not just spiritual death now, separation from God because of your iniquity, but separation, uh, you know, body and soul, physical death, and then of course eternal, everlasting death. The wages have to be paid, you see. You're a debtor, and you'll go to the debtor's prison, that place called hell, and pay every last farthing, says Jesus. Never be free, in other words. But you can be free today if you will believe, if you will repent of your sin, if you will turn from it and surrender and submit yourself to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who pays the price for sinners, the one who paid the price in full, so that those who submit, those who believe, the death is cleared, you see? All the red ink from the pages obliterated. And the writing is there on the opposite page in blue. Justified. Paid in full. Paid in full. Every last farthing paid. Nothing to pay. No debt left. All paid for. My sin. My sin. So that's why I call him like my Lord, because he purchased me. He bought me with his own precious, precious blood. He redeemed me. Redeemed me from slavery. You see, dear friends, we're all under sin. Some people live with this illusion, you know, delusion, that Mr. Wilberforce back in the day brought an end to slavery. No, he did not. He did not. He did a great work and he ended some slavery, 
But the truth of the matter is we're all born into slavery, every one of us. Conceived in sin, born in sin, under sin, under sin, under your slave master, until by the blood of by the blood of God's Son Jesus Christ, your slave master is put to death. And nobody else can kill him. Nobody else can slay your master, your slave master. Only Jesus, by his death, can liberate you, can set you free from your slavery. You're a slave to sin, admit it. Come on, come on, come on, admit it. You have to do the thing. You can do no other until Christ sets you free. You can do no other but sin. Nobody holds a gun to your head. Nobody holds a knife to your heart saying, fornicate, get drunk, blaspheme God's name. No, nobody, nobody forces you to sin. You do it freely, willingly. You know, because you're under sin. You're under the compulsion of sin. You have to do the thing. You cannot keep it in. All of the descriptions the Bible gives us of the natural man, woman, is that they're incontinent. You know, it's like when you're incontinent, you can't keep it in and you've got to do something to keep it in. Well, your sin, you see, you can't keep it in. You have to express it somewhere or another in some fashion because it's part of you. And only Jesus Christ can set you free. Only he can redeem you. Only he can pay the redemption price, you know, and buy you back. Remember the old pawn shops? Some of you who are older, you know, if you are short of a bob or two, you know, you could go to the pawn shop and you could flog something. And so many days later, you could redeem the item. You could buy it back again. Well, Jesus, my Lord, you see, he redeemed me. He bought me. He bought me back. He bought me for himself to bring me to God. And of course, well, he's redeemed me body and soul. Every part I belong to him. My body's not my own. My soul's not my own. It belongs to Jesus. So that's why I call him Lord. He's the one who rules and governs me by his word. He's redeemed me from sin, from the power of evil, the devil, you know? And the one who holds men and women, the Bible says, in his snare, you know? Captive to him to do his bidding, to do his business, you know? He's the great deceiver. That's his greatest tool, you know? He's, he's the inventor. He's the ultimate inventor of something like evolution. Because he's a liar, a liar from the beginning, you see. Deception, 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 deception. And of course, well, you're easy meat for him. Why? Because, well, you've got a deceitful heart that's desperately wicked, you see. And a deceitful heart will always gravitate towards that which is deceitful. So Satan, the devil, comes to you with a lie. And of course, you believe it. You don't really believe it, but you live out of it. You can do no other because you're held in his snare. And the only person who can break that snare is the only begotten Son of God. That's what he came for. You see, to set the captive free. Has he set you free? Are you a free man, a free woman yet? Are you free from the clutches, the snare of the devil? Are you free from your sin master? Are you free from the tyranny of sin and the devil? Well, Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my Lord. What about yours? You can't call him your Lord. He's not your Lord if he does not govern you, if he does not rule over you by his word. Well, then you're still under the rulership, the governance of Satan, the devil, and of your sin. Captives to a man, to a woman. So we bid you, we bid you go to Jesus. 
the Son of God who loved sinners and gave himself for them, that he might be your Lord, so that you bow the knee to him even today. Or at least, at least before you breathe your last and go out of this world. But be assured, as I've told you, and rather as God tells you in his word, because of what the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, has done and accomplished. He is Lord, exalted to the right hand of the Father. He reigns and rules supremely over all. Everything in heaven and earth is under his authority. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Better is it not do that today, perhaps you don't think it, but I can assure you it is, because I tell you, or rather he tells you, his yoke is easy, his burden is light, you know? Satan, the devil, is a hard taskmaster, so is sin, hard taskmasters, destroy you in body and soul, Jesus heal you in body and soul. Jesus make you well in body and soul. Jesus, his yoke is easy. He's easy to get along with. He's pleasant to get on with. You can't say that about your present masters. You can't say that about your religious masters. They're hard task masters. You gotta do and do and do in order to get the favor of their so-called divinities. The Lord Jesus Christ has done everything. Everything, everything has been done by him for a man, a woman to receive the favor, the divine favor of God. The Almighty, the Father, Creator, God, who sent his only begotten Son into the world. That through his person and through his finished work, your submission to him in the way of repentance and faith towards the Son of God, that you might be, you might be termed, you might become a child of God, loving God, serving God, living for God under his ruling governance pleasantly, wonderfully. Oh, Jesus, I tell you, he takes nothing from you but that which harms you, destroys you, and gives you, I tell you, in its place. Oh, I tell you, bountifully, beyond that which you could even think or imagine. Oh, the grace of God in sending his only begotten Son into the world that so that sinners like you might be reconciled to God and become a child of God. So we call upon you today to obey God's call. What is his call? Repent, sir. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Except you repent, says Jesus who is called Lord, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He now calls upon all men everywhere to repent. Repent ye and believe the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You'd like to learn something more about God's only begotten Son, the eternal Son of God, I invite you to receive a copy of God's Word for yourself. Take and read, meditate, study the New Testament in its entirety. Offer it to you freely, without cost and without obligation to you. You're simply for the taking. It's the Word of God, it's the testimony of God concerning His only begotten Son. And the command is belief on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Oh, dear friends, what a gospel. What a gospel, what grace that God should so condescend to send 
his son into the world that you him, that we might be saved, that we might have eternal life. If you'd like a copy of God's Word, do feel free to come and ask us for one. May God bless you. Bless you, my dear friend. Bless you. And the mercy, mercy heavenly upon your precious, never, never dying soul. Up there or down here? Ah, <laughs> cold wherever you go. It's cold where <laughs>